normal. I think the chamber pressure looks good. Probably not. Water towers fly! Yes! Ego does phenomenal. Why did not try to see it all? Bring it, let's see it all. Oh. Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these. Good evening and welcome to NSF's coverage of the third launch attempt of Terran 1's maiden flight called Good Luck Have Fun. I am Sawyer Rosenstein and I will be your host tonight as I see all of our fantastic 5x5s in chat, meaning you can hear me and hopefully you can hear some of our fantastic team that will be joining us. On commentary, right now we will introduce them. We have uh, joining me Alex Alcantarillo Romero. How's it going, Alex? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm doing great. Kind of middle of the night, very early morning, uh, depending on how you measure that. But yeah, really excited to to see another attempt, turn one, getting off the ground. We'll see if this this is the day. Maybe third time, third times the 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 charm, right? What what's the? I, I don't even know what's the, what's even the the phrase, but you get the point. <laughs> you got it right. That's the phrase. Third okay. time the charm. And, I should uh, sure stick with it. <laughs> nope, you got it. You're all good, Alex. And joining us from the field tonight is Thomas Berghardt. How's it going, Thomas? Uh, it's going well, sir. Thank you so much. It's a wonderful night out here at the Kennedy Space Center where we are going to be standing by for liftoff from Key Canaveral Space Force Station of Terran 1. Hopefully on its third attempt, like Alex said, the team has been monitoring, team, monitoring some upper-level winds, but they are back into resuming the count and currently targeting a liftoff at 10.38 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 2.38 in the morning UTC. From Launch Complex 16, potentially could become the first 3D printed rocket to orbit, could become the first methane-fueled rocket to orbit, but most importantly, it is just the first ever orbital launch attempt by Relativity Space, who has big spaceflight ambitions as far as reusability and interplanetary transport. So very exciting to see this company get their first rocket off the ground, hopefully tonight. And uh, we'll be showing you live views from the Space Coast of tonight's launch attempt. Exactly. As of right now, we're taking a look at some of the content from Relativity there as we wait for some pad views and some more uh, related to this mission, which we'll get into in a moment. But first, we also have to thank the people behind the scenes. We've got Kevin Michael Reed, who is the one pulling all the levers, pushing all the buttons, and getting the photons to you happily. And he's not the only one. We will also later be joined by Patrick, who will be helping us with some of the auto track on that as well. So in the meantime, as Thomas was starting to mention there, yes, this is the third attempt of the launch of Terran-1, a rocket that is made out of 85% 3D printed stuff. So that's the engines, a large portion of the body, and all of that. This is the sort of demonstration flight with no actual payload on board, but there's still a lot of significance to this mission. So, uh, let's start with a bit of an overview of what we are expecting for tonight's attempt. Uh, Alex, do you want to take that? Yeah, so what we're hoping to see today is obviously a successful liftoff of turn one um, and go at least through Max-Q. That's sort of the, what, they, what they're trying to get through today. So this is the first flight of turn one. Uh, and, and and so they are obviously cognizant of the fact that you know first flights are never truly like it, it's very rare for first flights to be successful, especially for a for a rocket that is made from basically the the, the from a blank sheet. And and in this case, it will actually be the fourth rocket uh, to do so. Um, I think the the three previous ones are. Saturn V, uh, Pegasus, and the Shuttle. Those are the only three that were basically from no heritage or very little heritage to basically being able to launch successfully on the first try. And so the company uh, has said that if at least it makes it through Max-Q, that will be already success for them. But they're definitely aiming for, for orbit, and they're definitely looking to be that first... Uh, company to put a, a, an orbital rocket 
fueled by by met methane um into orbit and we hope to see that tonight we'll see what happens um definitely as the payload they only carrying some we, we might touch about this a little bit more in detail later but base but it's not that they're gonna release anything they're gonna gonna have like a fairing half uh like you know it pops off and off goes the, the payload it's gonna be um it's it's an old print that failed when they were beginning their company and that is going to be on the top of the second stage there that's going to be the thing that they're going to be carrying to orbit today if they actually make it to orbit which i hope they do because that would be sweet right but yeah i think i touched on most of the things if i left anything please do tell <laughs> no, i think you got a large portion of it there uh, if you have any questions related to this mission and everything about Terran 1 relativity, you can ask us. Remember to tag us at NASA Spaceflight in chat. That way it appears in our special software and we can start answering and reading those questions. So, Thomas, you are currently out in the field for us tonight. I know the view is a little bit tricky from where you are, but what's the weather looking like? And uh, I know there were some concerns earlier about winds, I believe. Yeah, the, the watch item that Relativity reported before the launch was uh, upper-level winds being a concern, or at least a watch item. Uh, but that appears to have cleared as the countdown has resumed for that new T0 of 1038. We are occasionally seeing a view of the flare stack flaring up. It actually is flaring right now. Um, so getting some glows off the distance as the ground support equipment around the rocket acts up uh, as they begin their fueling processes. But either way... Um, waiting for an actual view of the rocket from either Relativity's cameras or our own feed once we have a liftoff. Once it does lift off, it should have a crystal clear sky to fly up towards space in. It's got a lot of stars out, it's a beautiful night, and not a lot of wind here on the ground. Maybe a little bit, but nothing crazy, nothing that we would expect to be a concern for the launch. Before the day's window, the Space Launch Delta 45, the 45th Weather Squadron, reported a 5% chance of weather violating any launch constraints. So very low chance of weather concerns, and it seems the upper-level winds have also cooperated, which are separate from that estimate. But either way, weather looks great, and uh, the view is gorgeous, so it should be a beautiful night to go to space, Sawyer. Exactly. That is what we are hoping for. Again, at this point, we are waiting for the official broadcast and the T0 time. Uh, as of right now, it appears we might be in a hold. And yeah, I can actually just jump in on that. Just getting an update from Relativity. There is a current range violation in progress, so they have entered another hold. Um, looks like the upper level winds are still... Uh, Still, still cooperating. They're on. They're they're watching them continuously. But that that's still in being watched. But the current hold reason is a wayward boat in the range. So we'll stand by for an update on that, sir. Thank you. Yeah, and the thing with the wind shear, a lot of that in particular, from what I'm understanding here, is that it has to do with the second stage of the rocket in particular and the limits that it can take with basically its ability to steer using its thrust vector controllers, fancy TVC. Uh, those darn boats in the range, which we've had a few scrubs mm. recently for this. Uh, last yeah. time we launched, we saw two of them in particular. Alex, what happened in the last scrubs? So on the previous scrub, yeah, they had that boat on the range. They were able to clear it out on time, but obviously they had all the other issues there as well. It's it's I don't know. Sometimes it's like with all the many launches that happen in the Cape. How this this even happens still to this day, it's, it escapes me. Um, but happening twice to the same rocket, <laughs> two consecutive attempts, that is that is very bad luck, uh, certainly. I'll add in so some additional context, because of course this doesn't happen super often, although I, I like yeah. Alex, continue to be amazed that it happens at all these days. <laughs> um, but the for those who may not be familiar, for every launch, there are hazard zones, both in the airspace, to protect planes from the launch, and the launch from the planes, I suppose, and also uh, marine, uh, you know, ocean zones that are being kept clear, mostly in the event of an anomaly during the launch that could create some sort of debris field or some other danger. Um, we want to make sure that no one is in harm's way there. So, um, if a vessel enters the keep-out area of either the airspace or on the ocean, 
Um, that is grounds for a countdown hold. And um, the hold can be cleared before the boat, in this example, actually gets out of the way, as long as it's confirmed that the boat has been made contact with and is on its way out of the zone and will be out of the zone by the liftoff time, you can go ahead and that isn't grounds to reauthorize a resuming the count. But until that point uh, is grounds for holding the countdown. So right now, the range assets, including uh, the U.S. Coast Guard primarily, will be making contact with that boat and uh, the boats are liable for certain amounts of damages, especially if the launch ends up being delayed because of their actions. And all of those fun things. So we'll stand by for an update on that range violation. Usually they get cleared pretty quickly. The Coast Guard is very good at this kind of thing. Um, so we'll stand by and hopefully get an update soon. Yep, and as you see on the screen on your left there, that is the keep out area and then the projected area of where stages may fall away as they separate. So basically that's a pretty decent sized area to make sure all the boats are out of and the Coast Guard is actively monitoring that. And a reminder, the launch window does go until 1 a.m. Eastern time. So that is about two hours and 45 minutes left in this particular window. So there's still plenty of time. So while we do that, want to just quickly thank people who have been sending in our super chats even before the stream started. Yowie Boy, thank you for becoming a Red Team member. Suzanne, thank you for becoming a Pad Rat member. Liz Clark, also becoming a Red Team member. Uh, Dougal, gifting a Red Team membership. Thank you for sharing the love with that. Florida Rich, becoming a Pad Rat member. And Moldy Space Industries, a name we hear quite often here, also gifting a Red Team membership. Thank you very much, everyone, for sharing the love and for joining all of the support there. Uh, we've got Dale Kirkwood, who, as we were getting ready to get live, said, we need a poll. I'm sure we can come up with a poll of some kind. Uh, Lachlan Wall, I don't know if I should read this, because if I do, then I'll tell everyone that you are uh, eating a burger. But, oops, that's out the bag. Uh, Musical Wolves coming in here with a good question. Uh, and Alex, I'll send this one over to you. How much prop is needed to fill the rocket? And along those lines, I'm going to add on, can you talk a little about the significance of this using methane? Oh boy, you're going to cut you, you're going to get me there cuz I have haven't I don't have the the numbers in front of me. Oops. I can get you the numbers. Um, if you want to at least talk about the methane for a sec, I'll get you the numbers. Yeah. Um so, <laughs> the, the 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 rocket uses liquid um Liquid, liquefied natural gas, uh, which is a little bit different from what we've seen from <clears throat> from Starship, Vulcan, and New Glenn, where they actually have methane on them. Um, here, it is true, though, that liquefied natural gas, it's huge majority of, of methane, I believe. For Terran, they use it about 95% concentration, I believe, um, which is like yeah, the majority, like the vast majority of the of the uh, fuel is basically methane, and actually that is sort of what 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 is constraining some of these turnaround times between re retries uh, for for activity because they need to load the 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 LNG on on the ground tanks at a certain rate so that it 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 basically saturates the methane levels. Um, to the to the required concentrations um so that's sort of also what limits them like if they were to scrub today the next attempt is three days from now because of that um so yeah the the actual number uh see it says the propellant but i don't see it because it's too too small for me uh twenty three thousand Everything pounds? that we've seen is in uh, no. That is that is the pounds of yeah, force or newtons. But that yeah. is the, the the force. Okay, okay, okay. Either way, yeah. Yeah, it, uh, sh it shouldn't be more than more than seventy, maybe eighty tons, because the whole rocket is, I think, a hundred tons of of thrust. Yeah, and then uh, I believe the dry mass of the vehicle is uh, nine point three tons. So. I'm not yeah, sure what it's, weight it's is full, but that's the dry mass of the vehicle, at least for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's, it, it's 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 a rocket, so it it's lo it looks big, but it's still it's on the lower end of how big rockets are. Yeah, exactly. Uh, 
Roseanne DeVosto saying, Hi guys, is LC-16 south of the landing zone trying to guesstimate where to look from my patio? And I guess it kind of depends on what direction you're looking at, but along the coast itself, it is south, correct? Yeah, it's it so is hard. Where is north, the, uh... I think. Oh, from the landing zones. Oh. LC-16 is north of the landing zones, correct? Yeah. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, the landing zones were LC-13 previously, and then will become 13 again. So yeah, 16 would be north of that. Uh, we also have another question from Musical Wolves asking, how come SpaceX uses a recondenser for methane-based rockets and Relativity mm. uses a flare stack? Ooh, Alan? I can take it. Oh, ooh, sorry. Can, Go for it, Thomas. Actually? Yeah. So once upon a time, SpaceX absolutely did, did use a flare stack. Um, that was the original configuration. The re They added the oh, recondenser. Yeah. yeah, well, they, yeah, they still have it. They just don't use it. Um, they... Love that. <laughs> The, the, the recondenser was added so that they could reclaim the methane and you'd put it back in their storage tanks and things like that. And it would not be ridiculous for relativity to do the same in a couple of years or so, or maybe even sooner. When they're ready to kind of streamline their operations, especially when they're launching more frequently, the flare stack is like the standard option to deal with storing large amounts of natural gas or methane. Um, same thing with hydrogen systems, actually. Um, and it does a lot more investment to put in recondensing equipment and stuff like that. But once they're launching a lot more frequently, I wouldn't be surprised if they go that route. Um, but SpaceX had a flare stack once upon a time, and they have um, uh, have evolved their ground support equipment to upgrade it. And maybe relatively, you'll do the same. Yeah, the, the, the reason why I told you that SpaceX actually still uses, it doesn't use it on the launch pad, it uses the, the flare stack at McGregor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There you go, getting all the secrets here. I mean, you can see it on, on the live stream, because, well, you know, yeah. we have a McGregor oh, live do stream. We have, do we have a live stream of McGregor, Alex? Ooh. Yeah, right? <laughs> hmm. I wonder if we maybe had something called McGregor Live, where it's 24-7 looks at McGregor, and you can even watch and keep track of all the engine tests that go on there, both for Falcon and for Starship. In fact, if you go there, you just, you're going to see on the top the that flare stack burning off. There you go. Anyway, uh, shameless <laughs> plug onward here. Uh, let's go to more of your questions that we've got here. Uh, here's a good question from uh, Aluminum Falcon. I will send this over to you, Alex. How similar are these engines compared to the Raptor series? So I guess also that goes oh, down boy. to what are the, at least what are the Aeon engines on board this? Yeah, so <laughs> it's it's very different because from the cycle, even the composition of the of the fuel, uh, while it's majority of methane, it's still not completely all methane. Um, or rather... Raptor uses it on a higher concentration because this is still probably impurities on the methane that Raptor uses. Um, but yeah, like for starters, the the cycle, the Aeon, the the Eon One engine uses gas generator cycle, whereas Raptor is full flow stage combustion cycle. Um, the thrust level, it's you know, it's very big difference between these little engines. And then the Raptor engines had almost 230 tons of thrust each. So yeah, that's that that's a big difference between both engines. It's day and night, even though they're using the same kind of fuel. Yeah, and so just for perspective here, because we're getting some other questions about it as well, we'll do a quick breakdown here of the rocket itself. For example, David Yancey was asking, what is the height of this rocket? And that's an interesting thing, because this is definitely, <laughs> compared to what we're used to seeing, a much smaller vehicle. So again, Terran 1, you've got the two stages, uh, stage 1 and stage 2. The first stage is powered by nine Aeon engines, uh, which combined for a total of 207,000 pounds of force at liftoff. Uh, the entire vehicle itself is a 110 feet tall and 7.5 and feet in diameter. That's it. So we're used to seeing a lot bigger than that. But regardless, it is still 
able to, once it's at full capacity, launch up to 1,250 kilograms to low Earth orbit, and will also be able to launch certain vehicles as well into certain higher orbits. So, and, and again, the fact it is 85% 3D printed as well. Yeah, and to those that, that don't use feet like me, that is about 35 meters tall, if I'm not mistaken, but that is with the traditional fairing. Today's, the first mission, is carrying an nose cone, so it's actually a little bit shorter. It's about 32 to 33 meters, a few meters shorter than when it is going to be with the whole fairing thing. And Astro Dave has a good question about that, Of is why is it using a nose cone and not a fairing on this flight? I can take that one. It's all about re reducing the risk to your first flight. The point of this first flight, like we touched on earlier, is simply to reach orbit. Demonstrate that the first stage can fire nominally for a set amount of time. Demonstrate stage separation. Demonstrate stage two ignition and a stage two burn in flight. Um, deploying a payload is not under the purview of this very first flight because it is very risky to put a customer payload on the first mission. So they will save that for the next flight um, once all of the other systems have already been proven. And thus, they are removing the payload fairing deploy from this flight as well, because that's only one extra risk item that they will add to the next flight, along with flying a customer payload. Um, you don't need to deploy a fairing to demonstrate you can reach orbit. And so, for simplicity's sake, they've got that, you know, the, I guess it's kind of a mass simulator, the, you know, the old 3D print from the early days of relativity that they're flying on board inside that nose cone, which will not deploy, it'll just stay on the upper stage, and the whole stage will reach low Earth orbit. Um, and that's simply uh, reducing the number of firsts that you have to accomplish for your first flight to be successful um, so that you can kind of divide it into the two different flights and your next flight will prove the rest of the system when you're ready to have a payload on board, if that makes sense. I think it does. And that's usually a good tip is to uh, not put paying customers satellites on your untested, brand new, mostly 3D printed rocket, right? Another Early good speaking, tip. yes. Another oh, good tip oh is that, God, I just realized what you... Yeah, is that uh, one way that you can help support the stream is through tipping. And we have our website, tips.nasaspaceflight.com, that you could do it directly there. That way you don't have to go through any of YouTube's stuff or anything like that. If you don't want to buy merch, you don't have to do it that way, although you still can. But it's a way to directly support the stream, and it's tips.nasaspaceflight.com. And we really appreciate everyone that supports it that way. And even if you can't support us monetarily, just giving a thumbs up, a like, and subscribing helps dramatically as well so thank you to everybody for your support thank you to sawyer for your excellent segues <laughs> i i mean I, i'm used to things on wheels so i'm pretty good with segues as well <laughs> oh boy <laughs> hey i'll take it king of bad jokes thank you uh kevin behind the scenes there for that fantastic tip anyway <laughs> As we continue along, taking a look at the frosty outside of Terran 1 outside. Uh, again, we are currently in a hold waiting for a new T0. As soon as we get that, we will send it to you. Uh, while we were talking about uh, the vehicle itself and it being new, of course, there are certain questions about uh, anomalies. So what is the flight termination system that is on board this one? Because it's very unique, and that's from Mr. Doctor 3000. Alex, you want to talk about that one? Um, very unique. In the, what in what sense? The, that it's the automated flight termination system. Uh no, I, I don't think this uses the automated flight termination system. This uses the traditional flight termination system with basically the the guy with a button <laughs> at, at the range control, and and yeah, the 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 the. The only user right now at the Eastern Range uh, for the for the automated flight termination system is the Falcon 9, the Falcon Heavy, basically SpaceX. There's the NASA Range there at Wallops, which also has Electrum, the second one uh, from the U.S., to have the automated flight termination system. But so far, there doesn't seem to be any newcomer for this. Uh, but it is... It is also known that you know eventually these all these rockets are going to go to the automated flight termination system, including maybe in the future, the Orange Queen SLS might also get it in the future. <laughs> so we'll see. All right, uh, we will definitely see about that. 
So again, as mentioned, we are currently in a hold, but let's take a second and just go over the countdown so far, what we've seen up to this point, and what we can expect once the clock continues. So Relativity is very unique in that they start powering up the vehicle and doing their checks seven hours before scheduled T0 time, or at least the opening of the window in this case, and they clear the pad and began propellant loading at T minus four hours from the original opening of the window. So it's been uh, loaded and frosty there for quite a while as they continue to top off the tanks. You can see the nice venting coming out from it. Uh, the next thing that we can expect once the count resumes is that we should get the go no go poles to proceed about 16 minutes before scheduled liftoff. And the official countdown beginning at T minus 10 minutes. Everything switches to automated in the terminal count about 70 seconds before liftoff. That means any aborts or scrubs that are called will happen from the vehicle itself. And then the engines will ignite, the nine Aeon engines, at six, minute, six seconds excuse me, before liftoff. And that will hopefully lead to a liftoff on time once we have that new T0. And then you can see we have all of the stages that will happen as well. As they have said before, their main goal is to at least make it to max Q, which is scheduled for about a minute 20 into flight. That's the maximum aerodynamic pressure and stresses pushing on the vehicle during flight. All right. Uh, let's take a second here and thank some more Super Chats because uh, we got Actually, a really lot. quick. Sorry. Can oh, I yeah. Go ahead. In? Yeah, we have an update. Or Alex, do you want to have it? <laughs> Yeah, so Relativity just gave an update that they are coordinating a new T0 with a range. So we shall be hearing about that in just a few minutes. All right, and the second we have that new time, we will stop what we're talking and bring it to you. Uh, so I wanted to thank a couple of people. We have a second here, Super Chat-wise. Foster Doug, thank you for becoming a Red Team member. Uh, Becky Winter, becoming a Pad Rat member. And look at this, we have two people who became Capcom members. So John Buck, thank you very much for becoming a Capcom member, one of the highest tiers of support that we have. And Elongated's Paper Modeling Tutorials, thank you as well for becoming a Capcom member. A reminder that Capcom and above get access to the NSF Discord, so that way you can talk with us off the air, talk with all of your fellow space friends and NSF watchers, in addition to talking about everything from not only rockets, but games, sports ball, uh, if Chris B is there, maybe horses and shuttle if you're lucky. So uh, thank you for <laughs> that. Uh, Peter Pan, thank you for gifting a Red Team membership. Florida Rich, thank you as well for gifting a Red Team membership. And Matthew Richmond, thank you for becoming a Pad Rat member. Wow, loving the support tonight. And Chris B confirms he is there. A uh, couple other ones here. Uh, Mini DRM saying, if it was methane, it would ignite the flare stack. <laughs> and I'm going to interrupt you for just a second. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Uh, before we touch that with a 10-foot pole, the updated T0 time is now 11.05 Eastern. That's 3.05 UTC. That is coordinated with the range. So once that clock restarts and gets going, we will update our clock on the screen as well. And that is just under 30 minutes from now. So back into the count. Um... Like that either means that the, the boat has already cleared the range entirely or it is on its way out and well in within contact with the authorities and they know it'll be out of the way in time for launch. So good yeah. news and back into the count. Yeah, right now the, the clock is, is holding and it will resume the count in just a few minutes. Yep. Like and it's we... it's still at T minus 25, but once we actually get to the point of being 25 minutes away, then it'll resume the count. Yep, so that's why our clock is counting. We are counting down to that T0. That is the T minus time, or essentially the L minus time at this point as well. Yeah. And that, that's when it is scheduled to lift off without holds. All right, uh, going back to a couple other uh, messages that we got from people. Mark W with the hashtag Chris G fan club forever. Agreed. RGB mode with a really good question asking, what is the use case for an 85% 3D printed rocket. Ah, I can take that one. So it's not, it, it doesn't change the performance of the rocket necessarily. Like the, the, the reason for them uh, pursuing 3D printing as the large part of their manufacturing process is actually about 
cadence and cost. They want to reduce the number of people who need to be involved in the manufacturing process. The idea being in a 3D printed structures are mostly automated. You tell it to start printing and then you leave for a few hours or a couple of days. I think it's a few hours at this point for most of the components. And then a couple of hours later, you come back and you have a tank structure or something like that. Um, so the idea is to reduce the amount of people needed in the manufacturing process and thus allow them to produce more rockets and more rockets at a lower cost as well. There are some performance advantages, though, because 3D printing does give you some different geometry options than more traditional manufacturing methods do, and thus the thinking is also that they may be able to optimize their structures for their strength to weight ratios, which is very useful in an aerospace application. You want your rockets to be very strong with the least amount of weight possible. Um, so there's also there's a bit of that in there, but the primary driving factor is actually a cost consideration. Um, as far as the use case for these rockets, this first one is in in the small set launch category, although it's basically a light launcher because it's, it's a little more heavy lift than so Electron, for example, and things like that. Um, and they're also using it as a pathfinder for Terran R, which will be a fully reusable rocket in the realm of the Falcon 9 launch uh, capability. Um, and that rocket is uh, intended to offer a fully reusable medium lift option, not just for low Earth orbit, but also as a use for future multiplanetary like cargo missions and things like that. Because um, relativity is similar to companies like SpaceX, founded under the goal of supporting interplanetary space flights. So um, that's kind of the big picture. But 3D printing, actually mostly a cost consideration rather than a performance use case thing. And that's what you're seeing there on the left side of your screen is the actual process of that 3D printing. So the way that it works is a very unique process called sintering. So basically, it's not like your traditional 3D printer where you've got the PLA or a type of plastic that's melted on top of the next layer. This one, a layer of metallic powder is placed down, and then the laser seals it into place, and it goes round and round, slowly adding the layers. And that material, by the way, we don't know exactly what it is because it's proprietary, but we do know that it is an aluminum alloy of some kind. Hmm. And one, one of the things that it's actually really cool um, from them is that in, in the pursuit of actually being able to achieve this economically, they are trying to advance the 3D printing technologies. Um, right now, they claim they can build a whole Terran 1 rocket in 60 days, but their eventual goal is to have it in single digit number of days. Uh, like one of their first most immediate goals is just like reducing that from 60 to six. So like a tenfold um, reduction in the time to produce the rocket. And that's that's incredible because if, if you can actually create a rocket every six days, it doesn't matter if it's like, because 3D printing, it's actually a little bit more uh, heavy in the terms of like the, the tank structures are a little bit more heavier and things like that. But if you can actually create it faster than with the traditional methods heck why why care right it's like you can just launch more <laughs> right i would um, say that a very similar argument to even the starship program and things like that yeah. like you most rockets it's not just about can this rocket lift your payload and and how it's also about how often can you launch and can you split your payload into two pieces for example and just launch two rockets within two weeks instead of waiting months for a single launch you know what i mean so there, it's a balance there and it's of uh, differing approaches from different companies yes and we mm. should point out the clock is once again counting t minus 24 minutes or so and counting until their new scheduled t0 yeah and also another on, on that same vein of the 3d printing mm, one of the one of their goals as well they're sort of in the same uh, vein of, of SpaceX going to Mars and making humans multiplanetary species and all of that. And Team Ellis is thought is that if in the future we're going to live on other planets, it's cool to have the ability to be able to, you know, from raw material to producing a rocket without, you know, go, go from that step to the other step without using a lot of tooling. So you have the 3D printer, maybe a few other little things to be able to manage how to move the, the rocket around and things like that but in principle you wouldn't need like big you know a mega bay or something like that like like a SpaceX has or, or something like that like you, and, and big cranes or to be able to stack rings and things like that like that is something that that in theory you would need with this 
other method of of creating uh, the the rocket. And so, you know, new ideas, different approaches to the same goal. I welcome that. Exactly. You get that competitorship. You get redundancy. You get again more rockets, more better, right? Yep. <laughs> All right. Uh, man, I've got a bunch of questions and stuff coming in here. Uh, here's a good question from Andrew Keller asking, what color flame is expected from a methane-powered rocket? Thomas, what can we expect? Yeah, so it will look a little similar to a hydrogen-fueled rocket where the flame is mostly clear. Um, if you go back, the, your best example would be to go back to one of the Starship test flights, and you can see the flame. It's not invisible, but it is more or less transparent. Um, it's got a little bit of a blue hint, and every engine is going to be slightly different because of different mixture ratios, different exact fuel, um, uh, but what makes up the fuel uh, is slightly different. But a bluish flame that is mostly clear. Um, at night, it should still be very bright. Um, and so definitely looking forward to seeing that. We haven't seen an orbital launch attempt fueled by methane yet we've seen one from china but we haven't actually seen it we just know it happened um so and it was in the middle of the day too so it'll look different at nighttime um but yeah so a, a clear flame with a, a blue tint is what we would expect but every engine is different so we'll have to see how terran one looks in a night launch yes we saw a tiny tease of it in the last launch attempt when they scrubbed a t-minus 0 0.5 seconds but it didn't obviously get off the pad at that point, so it'll be interesting to see the full flame behind it once it does lift off. Uh, a couple super chats here. Uh, <laughs> Matthew asking, could the boat be could the boat be launched away by a competitor? Maybe someone keep driving intentionally to the range. Uh, I'm not going to mention a certain other conspiracy theory from the past, but thank you for your support. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those who know know. Uh, <laughs> Here's a question from Jimmy J. Will you be able to see this from Tampa, St. Petersburg, Florida? And I think the question is, we don't really know because it's a new rocket, but the trajectory yeah. is due east, though. Right, Thomas? The, the trajectories head to the east. They're basically going to the minimal possible low Earth orbit energy needed. Um, but yeah, if you are if you're in the Tampa area, if, in fact, if you're anywhere in Florida, if your skies are clear toward the toward Cape Canaveral, Take a look. This is a new rocket. We're not entirely sure how bright it really looks. You wrote, there's only one way to find out. But it's worth taking a look because uh, the skies are pretty clear around here. So if they're clear where you are, I don't see any reason you shouldn't take a look and find out. Exactly. And time for the T-minus 20 minutes. Oh, wait, wrong rocket. <laughs> As we hit T-minus 20 <laughs> minutes and counting here. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. Uh, well, we are approaching, though... Um... Just quick mention here that we should be about four minutes from the go no go poll to go in the terminal count. So we'll see what happens there. Um, that's usually when things might be like, hey, hold on the the, the clock or something, right? And and then things things happen. But there there you go. The the timeline is there. Thanks, Kevin. And yeah, so that go no go poll is going to be at about sixteen minutes before launch. And if all goes well, we shall be going to the countdown at 10 minutes, 10 minutes. So we'll see. And as we have seen with them in the past, there are times where they have held in the middle of the count. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, multiple times they stopped at T minus 71 seconds just before they enter the terminal count. So we may see that again just as they confirm yeah. that everything's ready to go. But uh, yeah, so we are proceeding towards that. And again, as soon as that poll begins, we will bring the Go No Go poll audio to you without us blabbering over it. Yeah, and those last minutes, the, like once the the countdown begins, that is a very, oh, that's the that's the piece of payload that they are actually flying on this, on this mission, which will not separate. It's not like a true payload. It's a piece of, of the first printing that they did, which didn't go right. And that's what they're launching. Yeah, so those last few minutes, it's going to be very active. The the rocket will just start to to get checking all the systems and everything. We're going to see the engines gimbling and things like that. That's going to be exciting as well. So definitely looking forward to to that. Um, hopefully this time around it actually lifts off. 
Exactly. Yeah, that's that's what we're obviously hoping for here. But as we mentioned, they do have a window that extends until 1 a.m. Eastern time. So that would still leave them two hours or an hour 55 after their next attempt to try and recycle and go again if for some reason they are unable to launch at that point. Uh, let's see a couple other questions that we can go with this while we wait for the go-no-go no go poll. Uh, I saw a good one here that was asking... Uh, here we go. Fabian from Argentina asking, what is the on-orbit estimated time for the second stage? Thank you for your work. So is this one that's going to stay up there, just get disorbited, deorbited, disorbited? <laughs> disorbited. Um, I don't believe a deorbit burn is planned, but someone yell at me if I'm wrong. It is going to a, like a very low Earth orbit. It's like 200-something kilometers. So at that altitude, and a stage that will be as light as it is up there with a fair amount of surface area, it won't stay up there very long. It'll re-enter within probably weeks or maybe a couple months. Um, so it won't stay up there long regardless. But uh, in the future, and that's pretty common for first flights too, that trying to reignite an engine when it's in orbit, if you don't have a whole lot of flight history, um, is a little risky. Um, so a lot of times, like deorbiting your upper stages is a future capability that comes on after a flight or two. Um, but not really a big deal here because it'll come back pretty quickly regardless. Exactly. And actually, re relighting the the upper stage is usually something that that they do on these first flights, where they try to, like, once they actually do the mission or whatever objectives they have, if they can fit an extra relight, so they can yes. test that. That hmm. comes in especially often, though, for rockets that like will frequently do GTO missions, for example, or geo hmm. missions, or missions that require that. Terran 1 is pretty optimized for just low Earth orbit, which you almost always do with a single burn anyway. So I would imagine it's less of an important test milestone for Terran 1 specifically. But you're right, like, um, part of the reason the first Vulcan flight is going to the moon is to demonstrate Centaur's capabilities, which will include multiple burns and things like that. Exactly. And again, we are getting within the time now where we're expecting the go, no go poll from the teams at Relativity's Mission Control. Uh, that should be coming up any moment. Uh, so if you hear some funky music in the background, that is where we will also soon be hearing the call-outs. So I guess dance along until we hope for a string of goes. Oh wait, this isn't a weather satellite. It's not goes. Oh, oh. It's this so guy stinks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you liked that in the video. <laughs> Does it make it better or worse that I was the one that put that in there? No comment. <laughs> All right. Uh, once again, that venting you see there, completely normal. Uh, we are now under 16 minutes till the scheduled liftoff, which is set for 11.05 Eastern, 3.05 UTC. Standing by for the go, no-go poll to be conducted by the launch director. As we approach 15 minutes till liftoff. So another Everyone. question I saw while we're waiting here was, uh, what's the weather percentage from Ralph asking? How's the weather looking percentage-wise? Yeah, the uh, pre-launch forecast was a 5% chance of weather violating the constraints. So in other words, a 95% chance of acceptable weather. Um, and that appears to have materialized again. The only watch item they've even mentioned was upper-level winds, which is separate from that, uh, that estimate. Um, but uh, that appears to also have subsided or at least is cooperating right now. So no weather concerns at this moment. Very good. And as we mentioned, there was a boat that was in the range that has either cleared out or will be cleared out in time for the scheduled T0. And a reminder, there's also a... Go, no, go polls from Mission Control. This should occur in the next several minutes. A reminder, there was also a restriction for planes overhead as well. So in addition to the not Mars, there's no TAMs, which also go out uh, to all of the pilots now not sure if they've changed exactly what it stands for but uh that is in place as well because you don't want a rocket accidentally meeting a plane or a plane accidentally meeting a rocket same with boats so but not mars so is it like the venus or how does that work ah you're catching on sir i like it i like it <laughs> which i'm so I'm sorry gonna, hey i'm gonna put this in with rare flawed perspective saying nsf in the community keeps me grounded and in the sky at the same time thanks nice had to go along with the wordplay there. It was great. Thank you, Flawed Perspective, for the super chat there. <laughs> oh, boy. A uh, couple people getting exciting here. 
Uh, we've got, along those lines, elongated papers modeling tutorials with the support saying, strong feeling it will run into an airborne boat. Let's hope it doesn't do that. Yeah. Uh, and then Jurawa with the very important question. Is this a rerun? I've seen this episode. <laughs> for, those, <laughs> for those who don't know, this is the third stream that we have attempted to see the... Uh, Terran 1 take off, and I'm still peeling from the sunburn of the first attempt earlier in March, uh, I believe on the 8th, and then they tried again on the 11th. That one had uh, two scrubs, one at T minus 0.5 seconds, one at about 45 seconds. So, again, better safe than sorry. I always say you'd rather be on the ground wishing you were in the air than in the air wishing you were on the ground. A little bit weird that we are approaching that T minus ten minute point and yeah. we haven't heard any poll yet. Yeah, last Not, time they did uh, poll around wanna, fourteen. Yeah, I don't want to report this as something they are doing, but it is certainly a possibility that when they do get to the go no go, if no, it is no, continues no, to be no, this late. Here we go. There we go. You're going to pause the clock T minus ten minutes to assess high level winds. We'll update briefly with a new T zero time once we get new balloon data. All right, and that's what I was—I was about to call it. Uh, they are going to assess a new T zero. They're waiting for another All assessment right, of the upper heard level winds. From our launch director Clay Walker, we are going to hold the clock at T minus ten minutes. We're currently evaluating those upper level winds uh, and just make sure that the wind shear is okay with our stage one gimbal limits. We're going to coordinate with the range and make sure we have the. All right, so. Along those lines, we talk about the upper level winds and all that. What is the significance of the upper level winds, and what is the danger that they pause that they could pose? Excuse me, to rockets. Yeah. So there's actually there's different factors. There's wind strength, which is usually not the concern. The thing they usually are looking at is actually wind shear. So the change in direction or change in speed of wind as the rocket flies up through different levels of the atmosphere. Basically, as the rocket's flying at supersonic speeds, if the wind is going one direction at a certain speed at one altitude, and then a second later, when the rocket is at a much different altitude because it's going so fast, the wind is going the complete opposite direction, that can A, be a problem for the engines to con keep control of the vehicle and keep steering it, properly. So it could just lose, deviate from its trajectory. It could also just physically damage the rocket and have the side loads of the aerodynamics on the rocket cause damage and or destroy the vehicle so those are usually the considerations you're looking at and they are going to be looking at so not just the strength because if the strength is high but all in the same direction the rocket can usually just steer through it and be fine it's the shear that they really have to be uh, careful about and that's what they'll be looking at exactly and unfortunately it has wreaked havoc on rockets before in particular two significant shuttle missions, both Challenger STS-51L and Columbia STS-107, were impacted as a result of those upper-level winds, uh, one causing foam to dislodge, the other uh, with the O-rings that were already starting to leak. It just pushed things to the point where the... Uh, it, it, it's hard to explain. It's sad to explain, but essentially it affected Challenger as well, which led to it breaking away from the vehicle, the solid rocket booster, and then causing what we know today. So it's very important that we keep everything in check and keep an eye on those upper level winds, even for uncrewed vehicles, which we are now hearing, by the way, a new updated T0 time of 11.25 p.m. Eastern. That is 30 minutes from now. So just wanted to give you that update while we were getting that. Yeah, so that means they're gonna pick up the count uh, in about 20 minutes. Yes, the count is still holding at T minus 10, which we will, in theory, get a uh, new go no go poll before that point. A uh, couple other super chats here. Orbit, thank you very much for becoming a launch director. That is the highest level of support you can provide here on YouTube. So thank you very much for doing that. You get the Discord access, you get special mention at the end of NSF Live, and all of our love and gratitude. So thank you very, very much for the generous support there. Yeah, and they're actually already you know, on the Discord. I'm actually going to go and say hi. There we go. I send the the animated thing <laughs> that says hi <laughs> when people join. A little there wave. Go. There you go. <laughs> uh, Lords of Gaming upgrading to a Red Team membership. Uh, and then Dean Brillhart gifting a Red Team membership as well. 
A uh, couple of these here. We've got Space Ignorant saying, where in the Falcon is Chris G? We need him in this stream. Uh, he's a little busy at the moment for those who might know. Or sorry, next to highest. My apologies. Anyway, still fantastic support. Thank you. And then Axie with the hashtag ChrisX, which I do kind of like how that was trending in the Raptor side earlier as he gets ready to go to SpaceX there. We wish him the best of luck, of course. Curtis Thompson uh, asking, what are the chances of it getting to orbit? And I guess that kind of goes back to the uh, poll that we were running earlier, which uh, the results, according to you guys, is 41% chance scrub, 29% chance partial success, 30% chance full success. I guess uh, we can go around the team here of what you guys think while we're counting down here. Uh, Alex, we'll start with you. What are you thinking? Oh boy, I I will say chances of going to orbit are probably low, but not zero. There's certainly good chances, uh, but yeah, n not not in their favors. Like the the odds are not are not in their favor. Uh, um, apart from that, I think they have a good chance of making it through first stage flight. Yeah, but that we'll is. We'll see. That is the hope. And again, they have said that their goal is to at least make it through Max Q. Thomas, yep. your thoughts? Yeah, so like Alex said, the odds of a first flight reaching orbit on the first attempt is not in their favor, but not impossible. Uh, personally, mm -hmm. the thing, I, the milestone I would like to see them see personally is stage two ignition. If you can prove the entirety of your first stage flight, state separation and stage two ignition, those are probably the biggest risk items and any shortfall after that of the stage two performance whether it's an early shutdown or something like that you know that's one last step that they maybe don't get to and that could cause them to fall short of orbit but if they get the stage two ignition nominally i think that's a really really good start for the company and i think they would be able to proudly call this mission a success um, but of course every milestone they pass even lifting off is a, is a step of progress getting the max q is a big progress and nominal go every step they do reach is more and more even better but uh we'll see how far they get and uh, no matter what they're going to learn from it and come back with another attempt to either do it again or to make another attempt at reaching orbit depending on what happens tonight yep you could see one of those engine tests going on there from uh, ahead of this launch and i'm gonna go with uh i'm hoping that they at least get to separation even if they don't get to ignite a clean separation just and proof of concept that the first stage works we have coordinated the new UTC target time of 03.25.00. Clock will jump back to T-minus 16 minutes for go no go poll. And we'll begin count shortly thereafter. Okay, there was that official conference. All right, there we go. So as we mentioned, the new T-0, that is 11.25 p.m. local time here Eastern. That is 3.25 UTC. And uh, they will set the clock to T-minus 16 minutes, which is where they conduct their go-no-go -no -go poll. It has been holding at T-minus 10 minutes. So again, when they do that go-no-go -no -go poll, once again, we will bring that to you. Uh, while we talk about the engines really quick, do want to mention that the first stage has the nine Aeon 1 engines that we were looking at there. And then the upper stage is an Aeon VAC or vacuum engine, similar to Merlin 1D and Merlin VAC in that sense. Uh, they each produce 23,000 pounds of force at sea level, and the Aeon VAC is 28,000 pounds in vacuum. So just keeping that in mind, all of them... They do have uh, engine restart capability, uh, and they are ignited by a gas-gas torch igniter. So not TTAB like we're used to seeing with SpaceX, so no green flash. And it's interesting because the gas-gas, the gases that they use, it's not gases oxygen and gases methane, but it's actually gases oxygen and gases hydrogen. They are hydrogen um, igniters, basically. Which is, it's it's really weird to say that because you will expect them to to basically use the same gas as they are using for for fuel, for their igniters. But you know, it's it's okay. They they use hydrogen. It's just that it's a little bit weird mixing there, right? Um, the hydrogen, but it's it's a, an interesting thing. Yeah, it's very unique. All I could think of those uh, shuttle sparklers, but the burn off with those again, shuttle bingo. There you go. If I haven't mentioned it <laughs> well, up those, already, 
Well, those are different. Those are I sparks, know, but... whereas, yeah, <laughs> so people get that because there, there's a lot of people that think that's actually the igniters for the for the engines. It, that is no, not the, the case. That the was burning off inside. excess. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, so that it didn't ignite an accidental plume around the base of the rocket, mm. and, you know, big boom, big bad. So, yeah, the strange. I mean, the the, the strange thing from from here is not that you know they don't use the same the same fuel. Is just that you know we see Raptor in the case of Raptor, for example, they actually do that. The igniters use uh, methane and oxygen gas as well. Um, so it's like. Okay, they like to use hydrogen. The reason why, we don't know, but it's curious. Exactly. That, yeah, that is a good point. And uh, I just want to say to everyone that is public knowledge that information about hydrogen did not leak, surprisingly. No, yeah, they, they actually said it on the, on the stream, so... Slash whoosh. Get it? It didn't oh, leak boy. because hydrogen I, leaked. I, now I got it. Oh, boy. How has Kevin not kicked me from this uh, live stream Someone yet and me. muted me? <laughs> I'll give him ideas. He'll do it. <laughs> I know he will. Uh, as Kevin says in the back channel, he's thought about it. Thank you. That's so kind of you. Uh, a couple more Super Chats here really quick. Uh, RGB mode, answering his question earlier, saying great explanation. Thank you. This is the way. Uh, Jonathan, are there any launches that make their way over Wisconsin? I know we used to be able to see Starlink trains but not so much anymore. And yeah, the Starlinks are launching into different shells and inclinations and things, so it may be harder to see. But one thing that you can see flying overhead constantly is the International Space Station. It is visible completely to the naked eye, and there are websites that track it constantly, so you could see if the ISS is going to be flying over your house in Wisconsin. So if you want to see something in space, you can at least check that out. Yeah, and Jonathan, I'm going to be honest with you. If a rocket were to fly over Wisconsin, I would be very, very worried. <laughs> I was just going to say that. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Not that I don't want you to, to see a rocket, is that if it were to happen, I would be very, very worried. <laughs> yeah, that is true. And uh, I won't make any cheesy jokes about your state. It's fine. Oh, oh my dramatic gosh. Effects. <laughs> I hate that I have to unmute just to make sure you know that I'm upset about the boy. joke. Boy. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, all right. Uh, Jimmy J was sports saying, love the new logo, which thank you. Our team has been working on that logo for a while now, and I think they did a fantastic job with it. It's really, really cool. And uh, the fact that it still has that shuttle heritage in it is great. And a uh, reminder that... All of those logos are updated on everything at shop.nasaspaceflight.com, too. So if you like the new logo that much, don't forget, you can also wear it. Uh, Brittany Mahone, thank you very much for becoming a Pad Rat member. And uh, Space Pope saying, bless this test. We are hoping for a successful flight. All right. Again, reminder, you can ask us your questions by tagging us at NASA Space Flight. So uh, make sure you do that. Uh, here's a question from Sean Howard asking, will they shoot for reusability as well as SpaceX is doing? Do we know if Relativity plans to start reusing? Uh, yes, not with Terran 1. Terran 1 is partially a Pathfinder, partially just a smaller vehicle where the reuse economics don't make necessarily quite as much sense. But Terran R, the successor vehicle, is planned to be not just reusable, but fully reusable. The upper stage and lower stage will both be able to be recovered and reused. Um, basically a starship, but on the scale of Falcon 9, if that makes sense. Um, so yes, Relativity does have reusability in their future, but not necessarily on this rocket. Yeah. So it will be in the future, and Terran R is also really interesting. That's a much larger vehicle than Terran 1 as well. Uh, so that will hopefully be coming soon, at least that is their main goal. And uh, yeah, again, Terran are eventually their reusable version. So uh, let's keep going with some more of your questions here. Uh, we've got, um, let's see, uh, number one SpaceX fan asking, what happens to the second stages of Terran 1 and Falcon that don't re-enter? Do they become a danger for space travel? And each of them does something slightly different, right, Alex? 
Yeah, so first of all, for Falcon 9, it depends on the mission. Most of the lower orbit missions, if not all, do actually have the second stage re-entering. So it's actually a, a very small percentage of, of the second stages that do not re-enter, say, for example, GTO missions or beyond. Um, those do not re-enter. Even though there's some missions even to like medium Earth orbit, like the GPS missions where they actually do a deorbit burn. Um, so it, it might be maybe like 10% of all the launches or something. It's not really uh, a lot of them. But now, w when they actually do it, when it actually happens that it stays up there, it might take weeks, months, sometimes even years for them to come back. And it is true that they become a hazard um, in the sense of, you know, it's something that while we can track, because it's large enough to be trackable, um, or traceable, I don't know what's the actual name for that. But uh, we can track it, but it's not movable. Like, it cannot maneuver or anything. So it's it's in the way of things, right? And it can be, and it can pose a hazard. Now, again, I stress again that it is not a lot of second stages that are up there. And in the case of Terran 1 today, uh, if it actually launches and goes into orbit, the target orbit, I think it's about 200... 200 by 210 kilometers, so it's a very low Earth orbit, and it should re-enter in a matter of days. So it's not going to be even weeks, it might be just a few days. There you go. So yeah. Uh, oh, well, and, and I should also mention that if you have anything orbiting at that altitude, since it's, com it's going to be coming back in a few days, I'm sure no one will care that they leave the second stage at that orbit. Let's say that. Exactly. Again, because no one has anything at that altitude. <laughs> that is true, and, and yeah, that's been a whole big deal. Is everything now is the goal of creating as little space junk as possible because we do not want a Kessler syndrome going on. So, pretty much every single vehicle that launches now is essentially required to have a way to deorbit itself. And in particular, if there are certain vehicles that may not be fully functional yet, put them in a low enough orbit that they can deorbit. And I do want to point out, yes, that looks extremely bright, but that is completely normal. That is the uh, methane flare stack burning it off. So that is not a random pad fire. The vehicle is not in danger of becoming a marshmallow. That is expected. Just want to make sure we put that out there. We'll and jump again. in here and say we're once again at the TMI 16 minute mark, so we should expect to go no-go poll any second now if they are still on track. Exactly. We see people asking questions about if the weather is still go. Uh, we do not know yet, but it sounds like it might be if they are officially counting down. All parties on net. This is the go no go poll for launch. Please provide concurrence to proceed in the launch countdown with go no go. BC, BC go. GC1, GC1 go. GC2, GC2 go. Ground, ground go. AVI, AVI go, FTS, FTS go, RF, RF go, GNC, GNC go, flight software, flight software go, thermal, thermal go, prop one, prop one go, prop two, prop two go, fluids one, fluids one go, fluids two, fluids two go, loads, loads is go, rock, ranges go, OSM, RC, RC go, vehicle, Vehicles go. CE. CEs go. LC. LCs go. All parties have reported go for launch countdown. Once the clock begins to roll, anyone can call for a hold at any time. A hold is called prior to T minus 70 seconds. The T clock will continue to roll until T minus 70, at which point a hold will automatically be initiated. A hold is not possible after T minus 70, and any hold call after that will result in a terminal count aboard. Should a hold man manual be necessary, the person calling for a hold or abort should stay clearly on comms. Hold, 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 or abort, abort, abort. In the event that OSM requires a hold, OSM will initiate the hold command on the OSM GUI and notify LD and RC on primary net. And you just... And NSF is go as well. There you go. You heard the official go, including the range, which involves boats, planes, and weather. So it appears that weather is also go at this point. So You also heard the briefing there where they were explaining what 
once we're not explaining, obviously all the launch controllers know this already, but reminding the launch controllers the procedures to call a hold should one come up in the upcoming terminal count. But everything on track right now and the teams have pulled go, so let's give this one yet another attempt. Turn one, good luck, have fun. Exactly. Uh, yes, we are hoping for a GG today and that it succeeds. Uh, so a reminder, as they mentioned, the countdown will officially resume at T-10. Then the next major milestone that we will be looking for after that is uh, basically as we get really deep into the final count here. So after that, we will have the uh, excuse me the terminal countdown, which is at T-70 seconds. As they mentioned, they can hold up until that point. Anything after that would be an abort within the terminal count, so anything under T-70 seconds. So don't be surprised if at a minute 10, we all of a sudden hear them call a hold. They have done that previously just to take a minute, slow things down, and make sure everything is ready. At which point, we will then expect first stage engine ignition at T-6 seconds, followed, well, six seconds later, hopefully by liftoff of Terran-1 on its maiden flight. All right, uh, so we are now officially out of that hold and counting down. So while we're doing that, uh, let's get a few more questions in here. Uh, let's see. Uh, sorry, looking for some questions here. A little distracted by the timeline a second. Uh, here we go. And we are a go. There's the official tweet. And so, the go stands for good orbit, by the way. <laughs> While we're waiting, <laughs> I'll put this one out really quickly. Slightly unrelated to relativity. Morgan Johnson, Johansson, excuse me, with the super chat asking, does the ISS fly the same path around Earth or does it move around to give different regions the chance to see it? And honestly, that's part of why orbits or launches to the ISS are very specific, right? Yeah, the, the plane of the orbit pretty much stays in the same place. There's some caveats to there. But yeah, it's basically the, the, the Earth rotates underneath. It's not really anything else. Exactly, and that's also very specific to its target, which I'll ask a question along those lines. Uh, this particular launch, which direction is it going, and how come it has, say, a three-hour window as opposed to an ISS mission which has an instantaneous uh, window? Thomas? Yeah. So today's mission, and we touched on this earlier, the goal is simply to reach orbit. It's not deploying a satellite that needs to be in a specific orbital plane like the ISS, for example. Um, it's not targeting a sun-synchronous orbit where it has to be somewhere relative to the sun or like a geostationary slot that it's aiming for. Um, the, the requirements for this mission are pretty lax. And so the three-hour window likely just comes down to logistical things such as how long do you want to close the airspace and the marine zones and how long is the range willing to hold the range operational for our launch window and things like that. Um, and so that's where that three-hour constraint comes from, but it doesn't come from anything regarding the orbit that the flight is eventually trying to go to. Um, that will come in later missions, I'm sure. Um, but on these test flights, you usually are afforded the opportunity of, of a nice wide window versus an ISS window, for example, which is usually instantaneous. You have to launch at the exact moment that the orbital plane of the ISS passes over your launch site, so you don't have as much room to work with. Very good point. Uh, as we get down here, under 10 minutes to go, the uh, final Two countdown is going to underway. continue to roll. Minute, countdown sequence has started. There you go. We are just 10 minutes away from... And the countdown sequence has started. And uh, we just recently had our own countdown sequence to a brand new logo release, which just came out. And as I was mentioning earlier, our new logo is available on all of the merch at shop.nasaspaceflight.com. You can get all of the new t-shirts with the logo, collared shirts, hats, which apparently have been really popular since the release, all the stickers and everything with that new logo. Again, the hat embroidered like that. I, I do really like that one. So that is at shop.nasaspaceflight.com. And don't forget, any of the new gear that you get there now will have the sweet new logo on it too. So keep an eye out for that. And uh, yeah, enjoy the new logo on all of your merch. Uh, here's a question from Mark Rivas. I'll send this one to you, Thomas. Uh, what's the closest distance you're allowed to watch a rocket launch from? And I know a lot of that also depends on where you are, right? Right, yeah. Um, it depends on the launch pad and the rocket. Um, the There is an exclusion zone that is calculated based on the size of the rocket, its trajectory, and even how long it's been flying. Uh, new rockets are, have more conservative clear areas just for extra safety. Um, 
Launch Complex 16, the pad for today's flight, is kind of in the middle of the Space Force Station, so there aren't many public places you can see it from. Um, for those who have base access, they can probably get a couple miles away, maybe even probably about two miles as I'm would guess the closest you could get, um, give or take. But uh, from a public viewing spot, there aren't many public viewing spaces that can even see this pad, at least not from anywhere up close. Um, but for there are public viewing places at Antares, for example, at Wallops, where you can be watched from just two miles away. That's about as close as you can get off the top of my head. And there are some Cape Canaveral locations that you can get as close to like three or four miles. It depends on the pad and things like that. Autogenous pressurization. All right, the tanks are being pressurized and they are going ahead with the final engine chill there. Uh, I do want to just do one final super chat here and we'll take care of the rest after the hopeful liftoff. Just a big thank you to David Graper with the very generous super chat. Also adding, I received my new 33 engine static fire t-shirt and I love it. We're glad you do. P.S. Still haven't been able to get access to the Discord channel. Uh, we'll make sure we get on that. But David, thank you very much for your support. And we've had so much generous support on this stream and we don't want to ignore everyone else as well, but we will get to that as we hopefully see Terran 1 lift off. So occasionally we'll be hearing voices and that will be from the uh, launch control at Relativity. So if you don't hear me talking or one of us, that's who you'll be hearing as we reach about seven minutes now until the scheduled lift off. Vapor and look like clouds. You can also see the frost on the rocket and what looks to be small white pieces falling off. That's all just ice and it's because of the chilled propellant inside. It's so cold that you'll see ice falling off the vehicle. One major milestone we'll look out for is the clamps holding the rocket on their transporter erector so will let go. Arwa, well, let's walk through the launch timeline now that we're getting closer. Yeah, at T minus 70 seconds, the vehicle will go. So that's something we'll keep an eye out in the next couple this minutes. When the vehicle's internal flight computer takes control of the countdown. We'll then go into final. And there's the launch timeline as they're talking about there. Again, the countdown underway. We will expect to see that terminal count at T minus 70 seconds or 1 minute and 10 seconds until liftoff. As mentioned, everything is quite frosty now. All of the tanks are being brought up to flight pressures, which is very important as that was one of the previous scrubs that we had. It turns out that one of the tanks was off by one PSI, which doesn't seem like much, but in spaceflight can be a very big deal. So better safe than sorry, they ended up calling the scrub on that previous attempt. So that is something they'll be keeping an eye on as well as they get everything in the tanks flight pressured. And as of right now, they will continue to top off the fuels on board, which again is the liquid natural gas or methane essentially, and the liquid oxygen. So all of the propellants will continue to top off until just before liftoff, you will see the transporter erector. Yes, similar name to what SpaceX uses. That will slowly unclamp it back away and uh, that's when we will soon see the uh, rocket take over the entire count, as we mentioned, the terminal part of that count there. Uh, people saying there is a lot of ice on the outside. That is correct. It's very, very chilled. Again, liquid oxygen, you're talking negative 230 degrees Fahrenheit, I believe, and and uh, liquid methane or liquid natural gas in this case also kept super condensed and super chilled. So, it yeah, that, that differs from some rockets where only the liquid oxygen is the cold propellant, such as Atlas V, the kerosene on the first stage is ambient temperature. Um, a couple of kerosene rockets are like that, but all methane rockets, uh, methane needs to be kept pretty cold. And then, uh, same thing with hydrogen rockets. Liquid hydrogen is not liquid unless it's very cold. So, uh, depends on the rocket, but this vehicle is frosty from bottom to top for sure. You can absolutely tell because, fun fact, there was a Relativity logo and some cool yeah. art on the outside of it that you can't see anymore. <laughs> yep. All right. Again, that venting completely normal and is expected out the side of the rocket. Very similar to what we're used to seeing on Falcon 9 launches as well. Yep. There's the clamps going away and from the top of the rocket. Power. And that will lean back ever so slightly before being thrown back 
at All right, T0. now those cradle arms are going to slowly release stage two, so the strong back can retract. You can see the arms opening up there. All normal venting as it gets ready to pull away. There's oh, your look at that. TBC I love check. that view. And now you'll be able to see the Stage 1 engines gimbling or tilting, as you see, while we're completing those final thrust vector control health checks. A reminder on that one, the eight outer engines move, the, the center power. engine is stationary. The second stage will be doing its TVC or engine gimbal test as well shortly. All right, I'm going to jump in here from out here in the field. Looks like a beautiful night to go to space, so I'm going to wish Relativity good luck, have fun, and I'll leave you in the Strong studio voices of Alex and Sawyer for living. There. And GLHF to you too, sir. Strong back is retracting. Here you go. We're retracting those that and a half black minutes truss structure to prepare for stage two TVC checkup for umbilical separation now that both stages are on internal power. And now we're doing those final thrust vector control health checks on the upper stage. That's the Aeon MVAC engine, which we can't see because it's shrouded at the moment as we approach two minutes now until scheduled liftoff here. Starting final review of launch commit criteria. Wow. And a reminder, we very shortly, very we're closely approaching T minus one minute. I just want to remind all of us here that what you're looking at on your screen is 85% 3D printed, and it is about to fly. Reminder, we come up on the terminal count in about 20 ish seconds or so. That is Next up, when it would switch from a hole to an abort. We'll ask the range for their final status. Rock report range status. Range green. That was confirmation. The range is green for launch. We're on closing out. We are in the terminal count. Flight computer configured for launch. Under one minute. LD, are you go for launch? LD, go for launch. There is that final go for launch. We are just over 30 seconds away until the maiden launch of this vehicle. Good luck, okay. Terran One, okay. and have fun. Here we go. A few seconds away now. 10, 9, T, 7, 6, 4, 5, lift off. Karen, want to clear the tower? Control run over starting. We have liftoff. Launch pad taken. Look at that blue fire! That is the blue from the methane. Oh, oh look at that. Us. There we go. Oh, beautiful from Fleet Cam. Look at that. That is so beautiful. Look at the blue plume. Oh, it's so... Haven't seen that here before at the Cape. the nine Aeon engines. If you can hear me over the cheering, the vehicle is now headed downrange in an easterly direction over the Atlantic Ocean. Our next ascent milestone is max Q around 80 seconds. Wow. Karen, what is supersonic? It is now faster than speed ascent. Coming up on the 
important milestone which they wanted to hit is they wanted to get past max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. And that is our tracking camera now looking at that, by the way. Max that is Q. our field cameras on it. There's Max Q. They have <laughs> achieved their goal. We are on our way <laughs> to making a new history. Taryn Cameron ready to play today. You just heard that call out indicating Taryn 1 just made it through. Wow. Max Q. Historic. There's onboard we views as well. We just completed a major step in proving to the world that 3D printed rockets are structurally viable. Look at that. Look at the plume expansion. Wow. Even from a smaller vehicle, you still get that large expansion of the nine engines yeah. as the atmosphere gets thinner. I'm amazed at how blue it looks. And again, our cameras right now Up are tracking this, we'll this view. We'll be looking for a call out that stage one performance is nominal. Oh, that's... It, it still throws me off with the color. And that is completely normal because of uh, methane. Yeah. Yeah, we're so used to, to kerosene or even hydrogen. Anything orange-ish. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. It is flying downrange. And engine cut off. Miko. Looks like Miko, yeah. Standing by for staging. Ooh. And it did! <laughs> and we have second stage ignition! As you can see, we were waiting for Miko and upper stage ignition. This means that we had a main engine cut off for stage one. And directly following that, we had second stage ignition, which you can see the Aeon vacuum engine in that beautiful view in the night sky. Reminder, there is no fairing for this maiden launch as we don't have a customer payload but we do instead have a memento of the first ever circular test print. Of note, we, the velocity is going down at the moment. I am just acknowledging from their data stream that the velocity is going down, but the altitude is continuing to go up at this point. They have made it through Miko and staging. That is unbelievable for an 85% 3D printed rocket. Holy smokes. <laughs> Alex, your thoughts? I need a second to compose myself here. Oh boy, it was it was definitely definitely beautiful. I'm a little bit concerned about that engine right now, but I, I, it's it's a win already in my books. Yeah, it's, the fact that they made it to oh staging, yeah. Max Q alone, and then staging. Yeah, and it was beautiful. It was definitely beautiful. I uh, the blue. I, I'm still. Blown blue. away by the blue as we, again, continue to wait and see uh, hmm. the status of the second stage. But it looked like great first stage performance up to this point. Wow. Again, we are uh, continue to wait for details on what is happening currently with the second stage. The last we saw it, it was about 6,000 kilometers per hour and dropping. It initially, at separation, was just under 7,000 kilometers per hour. Oh, man, man this is the first Delta, flight. This is the LD. There has been a T-plus anomaly with stage 2. LC, please begin anomaly procedure section 25. Copy. All right. So there we go. They've officially declared an anomaly with the second stage. Uh, that is all we know at this point regarding that, that the second stage had some form of anomaly, but... Yeah. The first so stage... they are at, at staging that second stage engine trying to ignite, it appeared to, to be trying to ignite. Um, we don't know the case of the issue here, but again, you know, we saw a perfect first stage flight staging. Holy cow! And it was beautiful. I, uh, we, we've been getting sort of reports from our from our people from Florida saying that it was blue. It was like really, As really, you really heard blue. From and so... our launch director, we did have an anomaly with stage two during flight, but maiden launches are always exciting, and today's flight was no exception. 
Although we didn't reach orbit, we significantly exceeded our key objectives for this first launch, and that objective was to gather data at Max-Q, one of the most demanding phases of flight, and achieve stage separation. Today's All right, yes, as you mentioned, we are hearing uh, people in our back channel that were down there saying that they heard the rumble in Titusville, even a little bit down in mm. Cocoa Beach, and that all across the state, what they saw was blue, dava dee dava die. Oh, jeez, <laughs> Thomas, what did you was, see? Yes, that was what an is amazing your view. So the flame was like a, a blue tint, but almost pure white from this up. At least this close, we're only a few miles away. Um, super clean flame. It looked beautiful on the way up, and again, a beautiful stage one flight through Max Q, which was relativity stated big objective and to Amico in state separation. We even saw, and I don't know if the camera picked it up, I'll have to look back at the footage because it is a very small speck at that point. But we saw the upper stage try to start. It was flashing here and there. Definitely something going on the engine, but not a stable ignition. Um, mm -hmm. and, but we saw, we were able to actually pick that out. And we, and I, I, having not seen this rocket before, I was wondering partially out loud if that was just a very small engine um, firing. And I just couldn't tell because of the distance or what, but... We saw the stage two try to start and just didn't work out, but either way, exceeded Relativity's own expectations, and that's got to be a ton of great data to feed into their next launch attempt. So a huge congratulations to Relativity for making this big step, and I can't wait to see them fly again because, wow, that was a beautiful launch. That I could see that plume every night from here on out. It was absolutely gorgeous. I wanted to launch again really, really soon because because that was that was cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and night, I'm, getting... well, I'm sure it won't look quite that spectacular a day either. So night, I think the oh, night yeah. really added to it. I am saying that I'm getting pictures from people south of where I am, or in South Florida here, south of the launch site, and it is blue all the way down the Florida coast. It is bright and blue, and yeah, it's like you're saying, almost opaque. It's whitish, but yeah. it's bluish white how bright it was like or at least on the cameras it seemed to be very very bright even though it's a small rocket yeah so... it, it, it was definitely a smaller plume than we're used to seeing around here i mean nothing compared to mm. a falcon 9 for sure <laughs> but uh we were able to pick it out right away when it launched and then uh, also the rumble we did get a bit of rumble here at the press site it's again we're a little bit more distance and it's not a falcon 9 but we absolutely uh, heard it and it, it sounds cool. It sounds like a small rocket almost. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but it's it's more of a zip than a rumble. I don't know if that does that make sense. Sawyer, you've heard rocket launches. Yes. Do you know what I mean when I say that? Exactly. There's some where it's knock your socks off, holy cow, that's powerful. And then there's other ones where you hear it more than feel it. And then there's the ones where it's like, okay, yeah, the sound and the feel makes sense for the rocket that's out yeah, there. Yeah, it feels like it, fe it feels fast. I don't know how else to describe it, but it's like it's zipping through the atmosphere, is the way I want to call it. It, it sounds that's... very cool, but it's different. You are the third person I've heard from that used the term zipping. I, I right, just agree. <laughs> zipping or zooming. <laughs> So, yeah, you're not the only one who thought that. And there is a view of where the pad is, which at this moment now is empty after a successful flight of the first stage. Despite the anomaly on the second stage, they did make it to their goal, which was to at least hit max Q and beyond. So they did that. They did max Q and they made it all the way to staging. So it seems like a very successful first stage flight for that brand new 85% 3D printed rocket, which is really cool. Uh, you can even the... see some of that glow from the from your flare stack. Yep. Uh, really quickly, while we were doing that, while we keep an eye on the pad, and we are getting some pictures in, stay tuned. We will be able to bring you a picture shortly. Uh, we did get some support during that launch. Uh, Sean Howard, thank you very much for gifting a red team membership. Jerwa, thank you for gifting 10 red team memberships if you received one during this uh stream please make sure you give them a big thank you uh joe colvin thank you for becoming a pad rat member mike mcintyre thank you for becoming a pad rat member we've got a picture coming in stay tuned everybody oh and, boy uh, Brittany mahone thank you for upgrading to being a red team member uh sfs inverted asking, is Relativity planning on canceling Terran 1 after they get it operational, or are they also going to keep Terran R? Uh, I think that's going to be a to be determined down the future once we get this rocket fully up and running, but it uh, it seems like right now the goal is focused on Terran 1 and hopefully eventually switch over to Terran R. 
And for Chris B, uh, Ninja Decimator asking, how many horses can Terran 1 carry to Leo? 1,500 kilograms worth. Uh, all right, I'll stop stalling. Uh, Kevin, Julia has a fantastic photo, and I think this tells the whole story of just how unique the color is on this launch. There you go. Look at that. Oh, that really God. is that blue as it looked, by the way. It's just startlingly blue. It's amazing. That is unbelievable, that color there. It looks like you can almost see the area of Max Q there in the middle where they it looks like it throttled back a bit and then goes full blue with the top there. Mm. That is unbelievable. So thank you, everyone, for watching there. And one final super chat here. Thank you, Robert Kenny, for the very generous support as well, saying, love you guys. Keep up the good work. Of course, if we hear any updates on the anomaly on that second stage of what exactly happened we will make sure to update that online and of course on all of our social media channels uh for right now though i want to thank everyone who joined us here for this launch alex thank you for joining us always a pleasure and definitely quite a great launch today oh yeah it's, it's the first uh yeah. thank you thank you as well thomas berghardt who was on the field for us tonight or in the field Absolutely. On the roof, I guess, technically, is where I was today. But yeah, it was great to see Relativity get off the ground. It was a beautiful launch. And as of course, we all wish for an even better outcome. But it was very interesting to see the stage two anomaly. And of course, looking forward to hearing what Relativity has to say about their cause and moving forward and hoping that they'll get back on the pad soon. But always a pleasure to be on the broadcast, guys. Appreciate it. Exactly. That's the big thing. It may not have made it fully to orbit, but they exceeded their expectations and will definitely learn from this one. And of course, thank you to Kevin Michael Reed, who has been operating this crazy stream for us tonight and must be our good luck charm as we finally got this launch off on the third time. So thank you, Kevin. And thank you, everybody, for watching and joining us. Don't forget, you can keep an eye of everything that's going on at the Space Coast and along the Kennedy Space Center and Cape Canaveral Space Force Station 24-7 on our Space Coast live feed. So make sure you go and check that out. I am Sawyer Rosenstein. I have been your host for this evening's stream. Thank you very much for watching. And uh, yeah, later nerds, we will see you all very soon. Yikes, you bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these.